I'm Don Linke. It is June 6, 2006. We're at the Eagleton Institute of Politics on the campus of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. This is part of the Rutgers program on the governor, uh, and specifically the Brendan T. Byrne archive profiling key figures uh, of the time of Governor Brendan T. Byrne. Today our guest is uh, former Assembly Speaker William Hamilton, former candidate for governor of New Jersey, uh, who played a very significant role in the uh, years of the Byrne administration and in New Jersey politics, both before and after. Bill, you were born in the midst of the Depression in 1932 in New Brunswick. What were your earliest memories as a child about those days? Well, I, I grew up as an only child in an intact family. Uh, I do remember uh, we lived at kind of the end of town and there was uh, what is now two streets down, there was the brook, the mile run that runs between Franklin Township and New Brunswick. And there were some Hoovervilles down there, some tin sheds that, that men who had lost their jobs and families lived in. And we would see them coming, walking up out of the woods from time to time. They must have come to some houses. I don't remember them coming to our house to get something to eat. But uh, I remember that as, as something from from those early years. Mm -hmm. And that having a happy childhood with with fellows that I still know, still around that same neighborhood. Nobody ever moved out of that neighborhood but me. What was New, Brun New Brunswick like ethnically, demographically in those days? Oh, well, New Brunswick was a mix. It's always been a mix. A mix of Irish and Italian, Hungarian. Not too many blacks in those days, although uh, much more so today. German families. Uh, Catholic, Jewish, not many Protestants, I guess, uh, but uh, a, a comfortable town to live in. It, it, it certainly, uh, in, in later years, uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, deteriorated. Of course, it's come back now, you know, wonderfully. But uh, when I was growing up, it was a very wholesome little town. And I, I lived one block from Bucklew Park. You spent my lifetime playing baseball over there, not very well, but but uh, growing up there with, say, fellows that I grew up with and that are still around for the most part. When did your family come to this country? Good question. Um, on my father's side, in about 1880, and I have tracked them down to where they came from in Ireland, but I've not been able to track the boat they came on. On my, on my mother's side, her father was actually born in Maryland, so he's the only one of my four grandparents that are born in this country. And her mother came as about a, a, a young child, I forget, it was a, a few months or a couple of years old, came over from Ireland and, uh, and, and lived here in New Brunswick. How did the family get to New Brunswick? Was it when they first came to the country or somewhat later? You know, I'm not sure that I know that. My, my grandmother's father was a groundskeeper. He, he, he took care of, I guess, fancy family's grounds. And an interesting thing on his on his headstone, uh, his name is called Roach R O A C H. I always understood that it was R O C H E, and in my grandmother's obituary, both spellings are used. And I have a theory, totally backed up by nothing, that uh, the name was really Roche R O C H E, kind of a Norman Irish name, and that because of the work that he did, uh, it washed a little bit better with some of the fancy people, to call him Roach, which might sound like it was English, rather than Roche that was Irish. Uh, who knows? Was your theory also based that you have some ownership of Hoffman LaRoche? No, not at all. Not at all. No, <laughs> no, no claim to wealth anywhere along the way. Well, talking about wealth, what were sort of your uh, family's uh, background, occupations, uh, to the extent that you, you know? Well, my father was, uh, for many, many years, uh, in the Postal Service. He was a supervisor in the Postal Service. He later worked uh, for the Home News uh, as, a, as a typesetter. He later worked for the uh, New Brunswick Housing Authority as, a, I guess, as an office manager. Uh, he had been orphaned at a fairly young age and had had to leave high school uh, when he turned 14. So while I consider him to be a very intelligent man, and my mother, a very intelligent woman, she never went past seventh grade. Uh, it was the time. We went, girls weren't educated at that point in time. My father didn't have the opportunity to be educated. Mm -hmm. But they certainly stressed it to me. 
Mm-hmm. How did they meet? Was it sort of a family uh, sort of uh, arrangement? No or arrangement. Did they meet at school? Or? No, my, uh, my mother was a legal secretary, and my father worked in the post office. And as I understand it, she would have to come up to the post office and maybe a flirtation started and whatnot, and that's how it all got started. Did your father's roles as in the post office and with the housing authority uh, sort of lead you to the, think that government had sort of an important role in both uh, sort of your family's livelihood and also the advancing uh, over the generations? That's a good question. Uh, I don't think I ever had consciously those thoughts, but I certainly didn't view government employment as being uh, anything dishonorable. Uh, and I guess I've continued with it, you know, in a good part of my life. But I don't think I had any particular conscious uh, awareness of that at the time. Well, you're very young as we go through the 30s and the Depression, but what are your memories? Was it really tough uh, financially? I can't say that it was. I say my father was a postal employee. Uh, after he died, I remember running across some tax returns from the time, and I think he made about $2,500 a year, which sounds like, you know, uh, pocket change now. But we lived comfortably. We, we, we had a, our house that, that they had built, uh, a nice house in a nice neighborhood, uh, had a car that for some reason he stopped driving somewhere along the way. But I, I have no sense of having wanted for anything uh, materially. Uh, uh, I, I was a happy childhood, a happy childhood until my mother was killed in an automobile accident. I, other than that, I had a very happy childhood. What age was that? Uh, I had just turned eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, what was the role of Johnson Johnson and of Rutgers in New Brunswick? Well, both major players. Uh, I had no connection at that time to either one, but uh, the, I guess the two biggest institutions in uh, in the city. I don't think the county was of the scope that it is today. So the Johnson and Johnson and Rutgers were the were the two major players and two major features as far as the city was concerned. The, the, the population of the city in those days was probably about 30,000. Today it's about 50. It hasn't grown that terribly much over a period of, what, 70 years. What was your first exposure to politics? Was it local or was it statewide or county? Uh, what do you re- remember about thinking about politicians of the day or how government worked? Well, let me go back before that. My, my first awareness is that my, my late uncle uh, was elected to the city council and later became mayor of the city of New Brunswick. And uh, while we weren't close on a day-to-day basis, obviously it was an intact family, and I knew that about politics, but wasn't particularly motivated in any way myself. Uh, I, I, I finished college. I went in the service. Uh, while in the service, I decided I probably wanted to go to law school, not thinking that I was going to practice law, but that I wanted the training. And uh, it was after... Uh, I, I got out of the service, went to law school, went to practice law in Florida, uh, not my hometown or my home area. In those days, uh, you had to have a, re- a clerkship that might get you $25 a week in employment to, to work. I had recently married. I had a wife who was pregnant. Uh, I wasn't going to make it on $25 a week, so I was fortunate enough to get a position in Florida. And it wasn't until I came back from Florida, I remember being aware of political issues here in town or here in the county and sitting around a coffee shop when I was taking a break from work and complaining about the job that people were doing. All of a sudden I said to myself, I shouldn't be complaining if I wasn't ready to try to do a little bit better myself. And that's what uh, kind of put me forward as far as uh, politics are concerned. Well, I want to pull you back a little bit to the earlier years. You went to high school in New Brunswick. I went to high school and college in New Brunswick. And what was Rutgers like uh, in those days? Well, it was a, a fine university. Uh, having gone to a Catholic high school, uh, when you, you said you were going to go to Rutgers, the nuns prayed for you because it was viewed as a communist school. Uh, I didn't find that when I went there. I don't find that now. But I, I, I find that humorous because I, I would bet that uh, the largest population uh, of students in, in Rutgers probably are, are Roman Catholic today. Uh, and, and the poor nuns at St. Peter's thought I was going off to be indoctrinated by the communists when I went there. What memories do you have at Rutgers in terms of uh, most favorite, least favorite courses, teachers? Oh, that's easy. I, I, 
for no good reason, I started as a chemistry major. And uh, all that did for me was enable me to sneak by all my science requirements for four years. I didn't have any great grades in either math or in, in, in chemistry, but I got rid of that and became an economics major. Um, joined a fraternity at the end of my second year. I remember a professor who was a great influence on me by the name of Monroe Berkowitz, who was in the labor, who was in the economics department, taught labor economics. And I had a, a fascination about that, and had I not gone into the service, I probably would have gone to the Labor Institute over here and, and pursued that. I'm, I'm now glad that I didn't, but uh, the good, good faculty. Uh, I wasn't particularly intellectual in those days. Uh, growing up in a Catholic school, you got a very good foundation and fundamentals, but you weren't urged to challenge and think and analyze, and I think that came along later in my intellectual development, if it's come along at all. Of course, Rutgers was a lot cheaper in those days, but you were coming from a family of very modest means. How did you afford to uh, attend Rutgers? Well, ironically, uh, the New Brunswick Lions Club um, began to give scholarships to local area students. And the first year they gave a, a scholarship to a fellow from New Brunswick High School. The second year, a fellow from St. Peter's, myself. Third year, someone from Highland Park. That scholarship was worth $1,600 over four years, $400 a year. It paid for all of my tuition, paid for some of my fees, maybe even books on a couple of institutions. And uh, I worked part-time when I was going to school. I worked in the post office most of the time. Um, I didn't have any, any problem. I, I had money in my pocket. I could go out and drink beer at night if I wanted to, and I frequently did. Uh. After Rutgers, you go on to Georgetown Law School. No, no, I go to the Navy. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, a little interview of talking uh, educationally. But yes. Let's talk. Well, the Navy yes. is an education. Yes, also. it is. Well, let's talk about the Navy before law school. Well, um, uh, at Rutgers in those days, it was a land grant school, and you had to participate in ROTC. So I was in Army ROTC for two years, had no interest in the military at all. So they're not going to get me. Now, you understand that Korea has just come on the line. Uh, my grades were good enough that I could get a student to firm it. And by the end of my second year, I said, you know, they are going to get me. And, and the fellows in the fraternity house that, that I was comfortable with, uh, a lot of them were in Air Force ROTC, and they were going to fly. And I said, that sounds pretty neat. I, I, I'd be interested in that. So one day after working in the post office, I walked over to the gym where the Army and Air Force ROTC offices were. And I walked into Army, and I said, uh, I guess I walked into Air Force, and I said, uh, I'd like to sign up for Air Force Advance. He said, what's your status? I said, well, I was in Army for two years, but I didn't sign up for Advance. He said, what are your grades? And I told him. He said, that ought to be all right. You've got to go across the hall and get released by Army. I said, oh, I shouldn't have to do that. I said, I'm not signed up. They said, you've got to get released anyway. So I went across the hall and talked to Army ROTC. They said, we're not going to let you go. What do you mean you're not going to let me go? I'm not, I'm not signed up with you for next year. Said, well, you had plenty of chances to switch before. You didn't switch. We're not going to let you go. So I said, well, they are going to get me. I got to do something. I want to fly. I went down and I joined the Naval Reserve down in Perth Amboy. And the last two years of my college, I would go down there on Wednesday night and drill. And uh, that's I, I signed up for a program for ROC, R O C, Reserve Officer Candidate, which was basically O C S in two summers. And uh, went to Long Beach, California, the summer of 1953 went to Newport, Rhode Island in the summer of 1954 after I graduated, was commissioned in, in uh, September of 1954, and then they put you in a holding pattern for a couple of months, and uh, late that year I went down to Pensacola and started Navy Flight School, and went through that in about 18 months and went off to the fleet. What was flight school like, and how easy was it to adjust to the training? Well, it was... It was a lot of camaraderie. I had a lot of good friends, still have good friends, that I went through flight school with. It was challenging. I wasn't the, the, the nimblest guy. I, uh, I'd never studied physics, um, but I enjoyed it, uh, uh, and I did more than passably, um, and uh, enjoyed it. Uh, got my wings in, in, uh, in Texas in 1956, desperately wanted to be assigned to a squadron in Atlantic City. That didn't work out. I went to a squadron in Jacksonville, Florida, which is where I met my wife, where I later practiced law. So things have a way of working out. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
let's deal with the situation after you leave the service or active duty. Uh, what did you do next? Law school. Uh, I was due to get out of uh, active duty in May of 1958. And my squadron was going to the Med, going to make a Med cruise starting in January. So I put in to extend from May until August, figuring that I would do eight of the nine months and still be able to start law school in September. And I put the request in, and they came back and said, now we'll give you a year or we'll give you an indefinite extension, but we won't give you, you know, three months. So the skipper uh, said to me, Ham, he said, I know you want to go to school. He said, take the indefinite extension. I give you my word, the day we get back on the cruise, I'll fly to Washington, and I'll walk your out shit through. So let me think about it, Skipper. And I thought about it. I went back. I said, I don't think so. A month later, he ditched aft and drowned and never would have walked my shit through anywhere. Okay. So th there I was. I, I had a set of orders to get out in February, which wouldn't have done that. They were doing early releases in those days. Um, and the three, uh, the, the February wouldn't have done anything for me. Then I got another set of orders to get out in January. And uh, I broke to him and said, I'd like to have the January orders. Ironically, in, in those days, I was going over in, in, in the morning and going to Mass, and I was serving Mass for a Navy captain. And I went into him one morning and I said, Father, would you mind including in your intentions that I find out whether I get admitted to law school? Oh, law school. He said, uh, where, do you, where are you trying to go? And I said, uh, Georgetown. Oh, he said, this is almost a quote. The Jebbies, huh? What are you talking about prayer? Why don't you try politics? That was John Cardinal O'Connor, who was a Navy force driver. Uh, what other law schools did you consider, if any? Well, when I took the LSAT, I, I considered Rutgers and I considered Boston College. When I was doing this thing on a, on a hurry-up basis in, in early 1958, I don't know what made me so porky about it. I sent in one application. I sent it to Georgetown. And I fortunately you know, was accepted and went there. Did Washington, D.C. as the location for Georgetown have anything to do with it? or? Well, no. You know what it was uh, in those days? There were a lot of uh, New Brunswick area guys that, that who went to law school who went to Georgetown. And I knew it had a good reputation. And it said, you know what, this is a good place to go. So let me, let me put my application in there. I'm never sorry that I did. In those days, Georgetown had a, um, I don't know what they called it, an accelerated program, but it was for uh, basically it, for veterans. And uh, if you went in the summer as well as the regular school year, you could get out in two years. And I had some feeling that I was trying to catch up for the lowest time that I was in the service. So I went through in two years. I don't recommend it, but I'm glad that I did it. What were the courses that you liked the most and the least? Constitutional law I liked. Uh, conflicts of laws. Uh, the, the, the bread and butter courses, I wasn't crazy about the real estate and the sales and, and whatnot. Uh, and as I say, uh, I was not bound and determined that I was even going to practice law. I wanted the intellectual discipline of, of, of the law, and I'm not quite sure when that changed, but it, but it did. Uh, in fact, after graduation, you, you moved back to Florida, right? Yes. And what went into that decision? You're your, was your wife a native Floridian? No, she wasn't a native, but she, she'd grown up there and lived there. But she was an influence in deciding to uh, yeah. relocate to Florida. Well, that and the fact that, you know, you, you're out of law school, and now you have to get a job. And uh, uh, I had applied. Uh, I sent my resume to some judges in New Jersey. I sent my resume to a couple of judges in Florida. And, and there was no way in the world that a guy coming out of New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, should have been able to get a job with a federal judge in Florida. But in those days, the local guys really didn't have much feeling for the federal government. They were kind of anathema. So uh, while I didn't know it, the, the judge that I sent the, the resume to made an inquiry at the law school, and they must have said, well, he's got a couple of brains. And uh, I got a letter. I came out of a, I came out of a tax exam. And my wife picked me up, and she said, you got a letter from Judge Simpson. He wants you to come down for an interview. I said, forget it. I said, I'm going to be here taking tax two over again. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I passed the exam. But I, w I went down and interviewed with this judge. and was a wonderful, wonderful man. He was a, he was a gut liberal. He was a, f a native Floridian. 
somewhat on the outs, I guess, with his people. He desegregated the zoo. He uh, desegregated the public schools. Wasn't the most popular guy in town. Had an unlisted telephone. And uh, probably one of the real formative influences in my life in terms of thinking and political attitudes and things of that kind. At that time, were judges in Florida elected or appointed? Oh, no. Federal judges are appointed. Oh, federal judges. Uh, with a lifetime appointment. What were the types of cases that you dealt with as a clerk? Do you remember? Oh, uh, he wrote memoranda on anything that came up. I remember the first thing I did, uh, the judge that I w was, was clerking for um, was trying a, a civil rights case involving the, the Rayford prison guards who had been uh, torturing prisoners um, rather maliciously. They'd sh sh shackle them to the thing and they'd hose them down. and. Uh, and uh, I didn't like the decision the judge rendered. He, th he threw the case out. But uh, civil rights was big. The first case that I saw him handle was a, was a medical malpractice case involving the, uh, the widower of a, of a gal. He was a submarine captain. In those days, they had blue and gold crews for the, for the, for the nuclear boats that were new. And uh, they were a, a young couple from Fall River, Mass. And she had her sixth child. And the Naval Hospital in Key West gave her a blood mismatch. And she lingered about 21 days and died. And I remember he, f of course, found in favor of the, of the plaintiff. He gave $100,000. In those days, was a big verdict. Mm -hmm. that, was, that would be 19, uh, early 1960. So it was, it was a real experience sitting here watching a really fine legal mind handle the things that he had to do. And he would talk to me about what he thought and felt. And uh, it was an excellent experience. Do you think this really shaped your sort of political ideology as you Certainly was a later a, begin your political career. Certainly a, a part of it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and also, I, I guess combined with the fact that you were a child of the depression and you were a family of modest means, and the government had been very activist and aggressive during those years. Well, maybe so. I uh, I remember while I was clerking, I was I became interested in becoming an assistant United States attorney because I saw the kind of work they did. They did, and I said, this is you know this is interesting. Uh, you get to be a trial lawyer. You can you can work that way. So uh, I when I finished my clerkship, I I worked with a much older lawyer for a few months, and neither one of us were doing particularly well. And I I put a, an application into the U.S. Attorney's Office where I'd let it be known I was interested. And in. uh, this was the late Eisenhower years, and uh, the fellows who were down there knew me and saw that I had you know some ability. And I remember saying to me, Bill. We'd be able to get you the job. Get down and, and register Republican, and we'll be able to get you that job. And, uh, as I said, the family was not particularly political. And I thought about that, and I said, you know what? Change your political affiliation, even though it's not as strong for the sake of getting a job? I don't think so. So I didn't. And John F. Kennedy won the election that year. Came January 1962, I, I was uh, appointed by a Democratic administration as assistant U.S. attorney. Uh, to that point, uh, before the Kennedy election in 1960, uh, other than registering as a Democrat, had you done anything politically? No, I was just I was not where I would. I remember being a, incredibly moved by John Kennedy as a as a candidate, and uh, perhaps because of of his overall attractiveness, perhaps because he was a Roman Catholic and I was, and we'd been quote excluded from the political powers up until then. Uh, I don't know, but. Uh, Certainly, that shaped some of my thinking. And bring us through the rest of the Florida uh, experience. Well, the the office was pretty thin. I, I was put in charge of the Jacksonville office within about three weeks, and I stayed there five and a half years and, and ran it. And my boss had some confidence in me. I couldn't get him to come to town and hired some, some fine assistants, people I worked with. A fellow who today is on the 11th Circuit, or now on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeal. I guess he's retired now. Uh, first black assistant that we hired down there was a fellow that I recruited and hired. Um, it, it was a good time. It, interesting cases. I tried a racial bombing case. I tried um, conspiracy cases. I tried a few civil cases because you did both. It, it, was, it was an excellent way to cut your teeth as a trial lawyer and, and have responsibility. Because as I, I say, uh, I ran the office. I was the U.S. attorney in Jacksonville, but I was really only an assistant U.S. attorney. Of course, the U.S. attorney's office, though, has some political 
back and forth with who gets jobs and uh, relationships with the local sort of elected officials. Did that sort of uh, increase your sort of political knowledge and interaction? No, I can't say that it did, although I know there were a couple of people that said to me as I was kind of finishing up a tour down there that, geez, maybe we ought to run him for a criminal court judge. Um, uh, I always had a feeling I wanted to come back home and finally managed to work that out. Did you have to persuade your wife about that? Persuading is not perhaps the word. I remember she was crying when we left Jacksonville. Uh, she's my former wife now. We're, we're, we're quite friendly, but she stayed in New Brunswick, mm. so she must have found that she liked it in the long run. Okay. And in sort of thinking about coming home, what did you see as your career options? Practicing law, which was a big improvement from the time that I finished college when I thought maybe I'd go back to carry and mail. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have real high... Uh, aspirations, I guess, and it was as I moved along and had opportunities and saw things happen that, say, hey, you know, I can do that. I can. How did you go about looking for a job in New Jersey? Well, I would write letters. I uh, I came up and took the the bar in '64, and I won't go into that story, but didn't find out until '67 that I'd passed it. I was offered a, a job with a very good law firm in Newark in '62. But uh, my wife was threatening to miscarry our second son, so that didn't work out. And I was up in the summer of 66, completing the skills and methods course, which was now the substitute for a clerkship, and uh, walked into an office in New Brunswick, and a fellow liked me there and offered me a job. And while well, I made him wait, a year later I came up and went to work for him. Who was that? George Shammy. The firm was Pincus, Shammy and Sheehan, which was a small personal injury firm in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of work you did uh, in New Brunswick? I did a general practice. The, the office was highly oriented towards personal injury work. I did some of it. Um, it wasn't anything I really sought to specialize in. Ironically, George Shammy's younger son is my first assistant in the, in the city today. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of a town, you know, close-knit town. And what were the politics of New Brunswick and Middlesex County like when you came back? New Brunswick was was governed under the old commission form of government. Um, well, no, it was a coalition. It was one Republican and the rest were all Democrats. And they were re referred to as the Old Five. And just before I came back, uh, George Shammy, who was a, a political mover and shaker, had put together a new five that challenged them. And so in the May election of 1967, the new five beat the old five and um, uh, was followed three or four weeks later by riots in New Brunswick that were not of major scope, but you may remember that uh, Plainfield had deaths and Newark had bad riots and Detroit had terrible riots. So I came back onto the scene in, 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 uh, in the fall of 1967 to a law firm that was politically active, but my job was to be a lawyer, not to, not to be a politician. How did you finally become a politician? Well, I, being in George's office, I suppose, was a part of it, watching what was going on. As I say, reading and seeing what other people were doing. I was invited to, to t fill a council vacancy in the fall of 69 or 70. And I just, well, it was 1970, because I had just started my own practice. I'd left George and I'd started my own practice. And I begged off saying, look, I've got to get this law firm up and running. But I'd already begun to think that, you know, going to the legislature might be pretty neat. And so uh, about a year later, when I say, hey, I'd like, to, I'd like to screen for the legislature, they nicely didn't say, hey, you didn't want a council seat a year ago. But the, the, the scene was, that, believe it or not, in Middlesex County, four of the six assembly seats were Republican seats. They came in in the, in the Bill Cahill landslide. And uh, so there weren't a lot of people standing in line to run against these two incumbents who had, had run. And, and I did, and my running mate did, and we got the nomination, and we went out and we worked. And uh, when it was all over, uh, that was a that was a house that divided forty thirty nine and one the forty Democrats thirty nine Republicans and Tony Imperial. I was elected by the magnificent total of one hundred and nine votes. My district mate lost by one hundred and fifteen, and and I remember that uh, uh, people say you know 
one, my vote doesn't count. Well, I sat there with 109 in front of me, sat Eddie Hines from Al Burstein's district, or his area up there, who won by 56 votes. And instead of, in front of him sat uh, Eldridge Hawkins from Newark, who won by 31 votes. And next to him sat Pete Stewart, who won by 13 in a recount. And the House was split 40, 39, and 1. Well, I didn't quite believe that my vote doesn't count. And your campaign for the assembly was your first attempt at elected office. Yes. Well, I was I had I had offices in college, I had the Newman Club and my legal fraternity, but they were not political contests in any conventional sense. What did you like most and dislike most about campaigning? Well, I liked going out and meeting people. We did it with shoe leather. We went out to the bus stops and the train stations and met people. And uh, I was not as, perhaps as gregarious as I might be now. And I, that brought me out a little bit. And it was it was a good growth thing. Um, I don't remember anything that I particularly didn't like. In those days, the county organization basically funded you. Uh, my running mate and I each raised and spent about nine hundred dollars, and the rest of it you got flyers and palm cards and what not given by the county. So I didn't have the, you will, the ugly part of having to raise a lot of money. Uh, and and winning was sweet. The, the only part that wasn't sweet was that my district mate, who was kind of a, a, a bit of a mentor, even though he was a year or so younger than I am, he'd, had a, he'd uh, held a council seat in Milltown for a couple of terms. And uh, he, was, he was a great district mate, and I learned a lot from him in terms of politics. Uh, now we've heard in other interviews about that sort of very close split in the assembly during your election to your first term. What are your recollections about the split and the organization of the legislature following the election? Well, the thing that I remember most clearly, we'd, we'd gone down and be, before organization day and met some of the other people, and it was clear that we were going to make Howard Woodson the speaker of the assembly. It was clear we were going to make John Horn the majority leader. There just wasn't any doubt in our mind about that. We showed up on Organization Day, and uh, the the board wasn't working, and everything had to be a, a voice vote. Describe the board. The board is an electronic device with uh, 80 names on it of the 80 members of the legislature with, if I remember right now, a green light and a red light, and it showed how you voted. Sort of a scorecard. The scorecard, yeah, it kept what was going on. I mean, so that wasn't working. So everything was a, a monotonous and drawn out voice vote. And I remember we had to adopt the rules by by voice vote. And it, it, it was just something that worked against me. I didn't know what it was. I, but I didn't know anything. And I didn't want to vote for the rules. We voted for the rules. And of course, the rules were turned on us a, a little bit later when, when Dave Friedland from Hudson County took himself and three of his colleagues across the line. And instead of voting with us to make Howard Woodson the speaker, uh, voted to make Tom Kane the speaker. So that uh, there was an enforced um, uh, m minority of a majority, and uh, my my district mate, who was a Republican, of course, had voted with his party, and uh, the newspapers had railed against this kind of a rascally sort of a thing in the newspaper. And the next day, or the next session, he came down and said, "I didn't know what was going on," and even his own colleague kind of booed him and groaned. <laughs> It was a. It was. I re remember. I know you've had Al Burstein on tape talking about things. Uh, one of the things I most remember about those early days was Dave Freeland getting up and making a speech and and uh, trying to take a high road on something on some principle, talking about the truth is what it was. And Al Burstein got up and said, "The last speaker wouldn't recognize the truth if it hit him between the eyes." <laughs> Which I thought was one of the classic things I heard of all times. The, now, were you totally shocked, as uh, other uh, legislators of that day have told us, about the, the deal between uh, the Republicans and the Hudson County yeah, Democrats? Yeah, I had, had no clue that anything like that was happened or was going to happen. And it was, it, it was not a, it was not, I learned a lot in those first two years. Um, I didn't get any of my committee assignments. I got put on the insurance committee that never met unless, uh, they had something they wanted to push through that came out of the Republican caucus. Um, but I was paying attention to what was going on. I kind of learned the rules of debate. Now, you know, Mr. Speaker, will the sponsor yield to a question? 
and I guess one of the things that I am I'm most proud of, we were, during one of the tax debates or whatever, the great Dick DeCourt, who was the Republican majority leader, was up, and I, I, I stood and I asked, uh, would the sponsor yield to a question? And he said no. And, and I said, hey, you know, I'm getting to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what was your sort of personal reaction to the deal in terms of the role Tom Kane played at the time, and also your sort of reaction, I guess, to the uh, defection by the Hudson County Democrats? Did you have some grudging respect for the shrewdness of the deal? No. I thought it was a, a rotten deal, a dirty deal. I grew to have a, a, a real fondness for Tom Kane. I thought he, I thought he was and is a gentleman. I thought he was a fine legislator. He was a good leader. Uh, he later put me on the Joint Appropriations Committee, which is I'm looking for something really to do down there. Um, and I had a, I'm trying to remember who all the fellows were that went with Freeland. There was Freeland. There was Joe Higgins from from Union County. There was Dave Wallace, who was a Scotsman from. Carney, who was a lovely man when you got to know him, and I don't remember if the other fellow was Doc Wilkinson or not. There was another. There was another Hudson County people, and you didn't have any. I mean, it was the, the ringleader was was Friedland. Uh, he and he and Higgins were, were were pretty tight together, and he was pretty much an outcast. For I, I remember a year or two later, he was on the ballot in Hudson County for presidential elector. You know, I, I got to vote for the. And uh, all the all the Democrats won except one, and they they got even with him. They dumped him. But uh, he he uh, and of course Dave had a, had a checkered career. Uh, I later served with him in the Senate. A, an absolutely brilliant guy, a, a, as smart as anybody you would want to meet. Quick witted, humorous, charming, but totally amoral when it came to politics. I don't talk about his personal life, but when it came to politics, totally amoral, it was unprincipled. Now, you said you didn't get the committee assignments you wanted, uh, but what were the issues that you felt most comfortable with and that you got active on in your first term? Uh, I was interested in uh, no-fault insurance because I would studied that a lot in the campaign, uh, even though I wasn't a, I was a trial lawyer but not a, not a negligence lawyer. I, I thought that was an important area of the law. I, I had a real interest in corrections in those days and I wanted to serve on the Institutions Committee. Um, uh, introduce some legislation on that's now a pretrial intervention program because I'd seen that work in the federal system. Um, began to pay some attention to tax issues, which got involved in later. That's a few years ago now, and I don't remember. Uh, I, 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 another cause that I felt very strongly about was the Vietnam veterans. I thought that they'd come back from an unpopular war. Uh, and got very little respect from the public, and I thought they'd been treated badly. And I tried to move some legislation to get them some some uh, help educationally. And uh, so that was an issue that I spent a lot of time. And I got involved also in title insurance, which I had some familiarity with as a as a lawyer. Uh, it used to be that uh, when you ordered title insurance, uh, you'd get a bill. And a quarter of the bill was uh, you were supposed to keep as a lawyer, just for placing the business. And it didn't seem to me that that was quite fair. You hadn't really done anything to it. So I, uh, in, a, in that term or in a later term, put together a title insurance study commission, found out a lot more about the industry, and uh, didn't see it as really a nefarious bunch of people. I uh, enjoyed the work that I did there a lot. How did you balance the time commitments to the legislature versus the time you needed to pursue the private practice of law? Not particularly well. Um, in 1970, I'd opened my own law firm. I, uh, a year or so later, we took in another lawyer. A um, year or so after that, he left. A year or so after that, my partner and I split. Um, so I wasn't making a whole lot of money practicing law, but en enough to keep body and soul together, and pay, pay the bills, and keep the kids educated and clothed. Uh, but found I, I enjoyed it immensely. I, I, I got involved. I think I heard Al Burstein at one point talk about public policy as opposed to politics. I think that's what, what got me, the policy of you know, trying to do things that were in the right direction. What was your first... Okay. Okay. You want a tissue or something? No, that's right. Yeah. Um, what was the first governor you had any direct contact with? Uh, Bill Cahill. What was he like? Tough, bantam, cocky, able as the Dickens, could speak well, 
I guess. Oh, and I. I he said you didn't have any committee assignments. I looked on some things to do, and there were there were a bunch of boards and commissions that had many vacancies in very important areas. One had to do with mass transit. I remember. I don't remember what the other way. And I and I would get out of press release, and I would criticize the administration for not doing something there. And uh, I remember I got I got four bills passed as a freshman. One of them a very significant bill having to do with the rights of mobile homeowners. And when the governor signed the bill, he never invited me to the bill signing. So I guess I was getting his goat too. Uh, I later served briefly with him on the Capital Budgeting and Planning Commission. And there was a guy who knew how to run a meeting. Wasn't the most democracy in the world, but he knew what the agenda was. He knew how to move through it. And I hope that over the years, maybe I learned a little bit from that. I had, I had a, a great deal of respect for him, and I often wondered what would have happened. I'm glad Brendan Byrne was elected, but I wondered what would have happened if we'd gotten a Democratic legislature with a, a seasoned politician like Bill Cahill as a Republican governor, because Cahill was a, a, a moderate to progressive Republican. It might have, might have been a very interesting time. Um, he had his problems with the taxes. I remember that's we we met him there too, when he put his tax bill up, you know, trying to meet the the Robinson versus Cahill, because he's the Cahill and Robinson versus Cahill. Um, he suffered a real blow two or three weeks before that, when his secretary of state, a very able fellow by the name of Paul Sherwin, was indicted. So he now he's losing his right arm at interface with the legislature. And uh, it looked like he didn't have any Republican votes. And when he put his bill up, there was a whole package of bills. And they, I think they made a very bad mistake. And Dick DeCourt was a brilliant, brilliant politician and leader. But he carried all the bills. Something when we later got in, why we spread them out. Um, and they, they got the income tax bill up, and they got, I think they got 23 votes. And I had already decided by that time that you know I was going to support the income tax if I could. But there had been a tax study commission of about 36 people, uh, of which I guess the leading Democrat on that was Ed Crabiel, a senator from Middlesex County. And the report came in 35 to 1, supporting an income tax and, and a number of other measures. And, and Crabiel was the dissenter. And he made an argument that I, f I fully accepted then, I think had some validity, although I'm not sure I would support it quite so strongly now that there was a windfall for business in what they were doing, that the, the, the business was getting too much of a break. So when the, when the tax bill went up, um, I, I asked for the preparation and tried to move a floor amendment to say that it would not be effective until we did a classification amendment, which would have provided for a three to one ratio you would a, a business would pay at three times the ratio that a residential property would, and um, that had it passed, and it got a it got a lot of Democratic votes. In fact, I think it only failed by a vote or two. Would have brought on board all of the Middlesex Democrats. It would have brought on board, in my judgment, as I recall, Alex Benson from the county, and uh, Jimmy Florio from down South Jersey. And there were some Democrats like an Al Burstein and people like that who were already on board for the income tax. So I'd, I'd always felt that the 23 votes that the Cahill package got was not a true measure of what it got because I could have counted eight or nine more re Democratic votes to, to, that would have passed that tax or gone to uh, support it. And it was always rumored that there were half a dozen to nine or ten deep Republican votes that if it really got down to it and it was going to be there, it would pass. So that was really the first experience with with tax legislation, the uh, not not even close call on on the on the KO package, that was a, a pretty progressive package. And politically, did you feel your district was sort of on your side in terms of the tax position? I never got criticized in my district in any wide sense. I think that there were people who didn't like what I did even later on. Uh, but I'd studied it, and I, I, I was able to articulate where I was coming from, why I was doing it. And, of course, there was a, a deeply felt feeling, that, as there is now, that people are being pushed out of their homes because of the property tax, and senior citizens and whatnot. So you could, you could, you could make the argument that the, that the income tax is a fairer way to proceed. 
What are your other memories of the Cahill administration and, and their initiatives? We've spoken previously about the Meadowlands proposal was really initiated yes, by it Governor was. Cahill. Yeah, I wasn't crazy about that. Didn't support it. Why but not? It went through. I don't know why today. I, you know, there are there are stands that you take that you think are, are well informed, and uh, even some things, some votes you look back on, the things you support. I say, I really support that. Um, that I, 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 I guess I draw a little bit of a blank. Those those years went by pretty fast. I I immersed myself in the work of the of the Joint Appropriations Committee in my second year. I I, I, I got a seat on that and enjoyed it. Um, I was moving my own bills as far as uh, veterans and and mobile homes and and uh, idle insurance and things of that kind. Um, I think I think the Cahill years were very progressive years for the state. Uh, but I don't remember particularly the, the interaction as I sit here right now. Perhaps in later years, environmental issues became more of a significant issue, particularly in Middlesex County with some of the uh, problems that uh, were discovered. Uh, and the Cahill administration also sort of created the, for the Department of Environmental Protection and developed a lot of the initial environmental laws. Was that a major issue at that time, or was it something just coming to to the uh, attention of the public? It, it was on the scene. I, I'm trying to remember now whether CAFRA, the Coastal Area Review, whether whether that was a Cahill or a Byrne initiative. Um, I I do know I had an interesting experience. Uh, we you used to go in the campaign season. You'd be invited in by organized labor to meet and talk about their bills, and. Uh, I, it must have been in that first term. I, I showed up, and now we're running for re-election. And one of the people in our delegation was Jack Fay. He was running for the Senate now, but he served with us in the Assembly. And Jack Fay was a teacher, an AFT teacher. So they said, Brother Fay, said Brother Fay, you were with us on 20 out of 21 bills, but you were against us on that coastal area protection bill. And Brother Fay, I don't know whether we can support you or not. And Jack Fay, to his great credit, he's he's not with us any longer. He said, "Well, he said, I voted for that bill because I believed in it, and I would vote for it again today." And and they didn't support him, uh, at least at first. I remember going down to a Princeton uh, football game, Princeton Rutgers football game, and ran into Joel Jacobson, who was very active in the labor movement with the auto workers. And I said, Joel, I said, that awful what they're doing to Fay. They're they're not going to support him because of the Coastal Area Protection Bill. Joel says, don't you worry about Jack Fay. He said, they support him, we're going to give him $300. If they don't support him, we're going to give him $1,500, <laughs> which, which is a large contribution in those days. So there are things that, that even up. Uh, politically, the Cahill administration, as you've indicated, runs into serious problems in that one term in office. Uh, did you have mixed feelings? You seem to think that Governor Cahill was an effective governor and started some worthwhile initiatives and probably had his sort of heart in the right place in terms of school finance and where the state was going. Uh, but as a Democrat, you must have felt, well, this is an opportunity for us to take the governor's sure. chair. Sure. Uh, the thing that you couldn't like too much about Bill Cahill, because I didn't know him personally that well, tough as nails. Um, Brendan Byrne had a a softness about him, and I don't mean a soft weakness. I mean there, there was a genuine feeling. I, maybe if I had known Bill Cahill better, I would have felt that way about him. But I certainly didn't, so I didn't have those feelings about him. Uh, and of course, he was he was hammered in the primary. Who votes in the Republican primary? The, the right wing voters. And uh, it was uh, Charlie Sandman who supported Richard Nixon on impeachment. Uh, went and, uh, there was uh, allegations of corruption, or there always are. Um, I think I think the the Paul Sherwin indictment and I was some, something that was bid rigging or election fraud of some kind uh, certainly hurt KL. But it was really the makeup of the Republican Party at that point in time. Mm -hmm. The people who came out and voted in the primary were the right wing voters, uh, and they weren't having much to do with this guy who who tried to sell them an income tax, and uh, so he went down the drain and. Uh, a piece of cake for Brennan Byrne. I mean, I, I, I've always understood that, that Brennan was selected as the candidate by the powers that be 
because he wasn't going to upset the apple cart, that he would go and take his lumps and be beaten by Bill Cahill and uh, probably go back on the bench. I'd be perfectly happy. Well, it's, you know, sometimes the best laid plans of, of mice and men go, go, go awry. Uh, Bill Cahill gets, gets, gets defeated. Brendan Byrne, they, some mobster gets quoted as saying he's the man who couldn't be bought. And, hey, you got a, you got a whirlwind uh, election in which you, you take 66 seats out of the 80 in the assembly, and he wins in a landslide. Uh, we've also heard in prior sessions that the Bill Cahill's style, and you've alluded to it already, being pretty direct, maybe confrontational. Direct also, is polite. <laughs> <laughs> also led to perhaps his defeat on the or it contributed, not led, but contributed uh, to losing support, particularly within his own party. Do you, do you feel that, or was that really a minor factor? I don't. I don't. Th I don't think that contributed to the defeat of the income tax. Uh, I think he probably left some some uh, some people with hard feelings, but he was effective. I mean, he he knew how to move people and get them done, and and, and I guess in his own way was a likable. He used to refer to him as a shot in a beer Irishman. Mm -hmm. I think that's maybe what he was. Uh, uh, probably some of the more highfalutin people in the party would not have cared for him that much, but he was. Uh, I had a, a, a grudging affection for him. As you looked at that primary field uh, in the 1973 election, what were your own sort of considerations, both politically and personally? Who did you like, dislike, or where did you wind up? Well, there was only one candidate. Uh, and that, I mean, Ed Cravio was in there for just a little bit, and you, you had to kind of be supportive of him as a hometown guy, but he pulled out, and Brendan Byrne was the only guy you could go with. I mean... Uh, I think Ann Klein, who had been a one-term assemblyman, was a fellow by the name of, oh, I later knew his son from, from Union County. It was, it was not a spectacular field, and, and, and Brendan was clearly the star in the field and, uh, and, and deserved to win. And uh, I, remember, I remember feeling uh, a little uh, unhappy that he wasn't being more aggressive about the tax issue. Of course, he was smart. I mean, he, all he would have had to do was say, yeah, I'm, I love that income tax and I want to push it in. And, and uh, he either wouldn't have won or the margin of victory would have been, been much less. Uh, but uh, he far and away the best candidate. Uh, at that time, did you think he was so far ahead and the election was such a lock that he could have taken a more forthright position on the income tax? I, I don't know. I, you know. I was still learning my way around. You know, if it was the right thing to do, it was the right thing to do. Well, it isn't. Oh, sometimes you have to take, take a little bit slower. Um, I, I didn't have any real strong feelings about him not doing it, but I, but I remember feeling a little disappointment that that he had not taken a, a perhaps a more progressive view with respect to the tax. Bill, why don't we end this session now? Sure. Hope that you'll come back to continue this uh, at some convenient point, uh, and. Uh, and uh, talk more about Brendan Byrne, the rest of your political career, uh, and New Jersey in general. Sounds good to me.